back and translate. He said, in the Koran, Abraham sacrifices Ishmael. And he said, you should not have said Abraham sacrifices Isaac. <laughs> Well, I never checked that out in the Quran, but that's what he told me, and everything was calm after that. <laughs> it doesn't matter how many they were, the god of war has cut them down at the knees, and the only one who could save the city, you just now killed as he fought for his country. My Hector. It is for him I have come to the Greek ships to get him back from you. I've brought a fortune in ransom. Respect the gods, Achilles. Think of your own father and pity me. I am more pitiable than your own father. I have borne what no man who has walked this earth has ever yet borne. I have kissed the hand of the man who killed I told you yesterday of the woman who goes on college campuses and tells about the abduction of her infant daughter and how she adopted the man who killed the daughter and prevented the state of Montana from executing me. I have kissed the hand of a man who killed my son. He spoke, watch the psychology here, and sorrow for his own father welled up in Achilles. Achilles has Priam right in front of him, but what Priam has, has forced him to do is to understand his own father's predicament. And uh, Van Doren says of Homer that he always has exactly the right relationship to his characters. There's no sentimentality here. It isn't, oh, poor you, you are the only man who's ever kissed the hand of the man who killed your son, therefore I'm going to embrace you because you're a great guy. Uh -uh. He spoke in sorrow for his own father, well of an Achilles. He took Priam's hand and gently pushed the old man away. There no big embrace here. The two of them sit solitary. And the two of them remembered. Priam huddled in grief at Achilles' feet, cried and moaned softly for this man-slaying Hector. And Achilles cried for his father and for Patroclus. And the sound filled the room. And we're told that uh, Egypt and Israel came to some form of peace when Anwar Sadat opened the coffin of either his brother or his son and said, the killing has got to stop. That's a historical moment. Anwar Sadat lost a member of his own family. When it, and they can't go on killing each other's families. They have families too. So he sends a message by, uh, by a diplomatic courier to Begum saying, we'll meet. And Begum saying, you kidding? <laughs> This is a joke. But they do meet. And they have not been to war. But, but uh, Sabat was killed for doing that, for being compassionate, for reliving the Achilles and Priam story. When Achilles had his fill of grief and the aching sorrow left his heart, then he rose from his chair and lifted the old man by his hand, pitying his white hair and beard, and his words, the power of speech, and his words enfolded him like wings. After Achilles has understood fully the nature of the grief that his dad has experienced in not having Achilles by his side, and after having gone, it's a process. It's a process. The forgiveness can't come automatically. There has to be a period of uh, feeling the terror um, of what 
it is to be human and how quickly a loss can take people away from us. That Achilles then comes to a recognition. Ah, the suffering you've had. And the courage to come here alone to the Greek ships and meet my eye. The man who slaughtered your many fine sons. You have a heart of iron. But come sit on this chair. Let our pain lie at rest a little. No matter how much we hurt him. There's nothing to be gained from cold grief. The gods have woven pain into mortal lives, while in their own their lives are free from care. Two jars sit at the doorstep of Zeus, filled with gifts that he gives, one full of good things, the other of evil. If Zeus gives a man a mixture from both jars, sometimes life is good for him, sometimes not. But if all he gives you is from a jar of woe, you become a pariah. And hunger drives you over the bright earth, dishonored by gods and men. And those three lines are at the origin of the Greek sense that justice is welcoming the stranger. There are some people whose lives are so filled with sorrow. Jack McKinnon must have loved his wife with a love that would be hard for us to imagine. And he has to go into the woods because he can't think of any other remedy for the loss that he's endured. He cannot be consoled. He even takes his children and hands them over to somebody else. He knows that life has no meaning for him now that he's lost his wife. Some men do love women that way. And some women do love men that way. And some parents do love children. There are some whose lives are filled with woe. Elsie? Now, just when you're talking about this beginning, these people never want to say thank you to me for being just friends. <coughs> they never want to. And, and there's pain in that. And there's pain in that because Jack's life only meant something because of the life that you had given him afterwards. And there's a failure there. That makes us see how powerful a moment this is. They were never able to put themselves in your shoes. She uh, evidently had left the church because she wondered why he was buried in the Catholic cemetery. Yeah. And I told her, I said, he was Catholic because he said the rosary with us. And, yeah. and he was there all the time. And she just kind of left me feeling flat. Of course, of course, yes. Mm -hmm. but, but, but that anger on her part was really uh, part of a deep hurt that she wasn't able to express. Yeah. You know, but, but it doesn't make it any easier for you. It, it didn't bother me because yeah. Jack was Jack. Yeah. That's wonderful that you took the name of a man who had a tattoo on his arm. <laughs> I wouldn't believe that in a story. <laughs> is also, as you said, the Frost Pole. He just kept coming back whenever. Home is where, Frost says, home is where when you go there, they have to take you in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's it. He came back every summer. Every yeah. summer. Yeah. I knew a priest who used to hide people in his religious community, if, and I know a nun who does the same thing. The community would say, you can't take strangers into this place. <laughs> and this guy would hide them, and she did the same. The conclusion of Elsie's story is the sort of the opposite of what we're reading. Here, because here you have Priam seeking to put some closure on his son Hector. Mm -hmm. There you had a daughter uh, or granddaughter looking for her grandfather. And um, you have a lot of children today looking for parents. Mm -hmm. um, and finding no closure. Right. Mm -hmm. That's pretty. That's brilliant. Thank you. That's brilliant. No. Yep. Elsie's story is a story of a woman who can't find closure. And here we find a story of a person who can. Yeah. Thank you, John. It's beautiful. Thank you. If she had just said thank you for... If only she had said...
said thank you. No, no. no. It happens all the time in the classroom. I'll see. <laughs> just been supervising student teachers for Melissa. She worked very, very hard with a young woman uh, who was uh, who had several defects in her teaching, and she wanted to correct the defects so that the woman would be a better teacher. The hate that that mm. child uh, pointed towards my wife. Unbelievable. Uh, but you just have to smile. Well, that's the way it goes. At some point, <laughs> we hope. Uh, my dad was a school administrator for all of his life. He dealt with some really sick uh, kids sometimes, and always his uh, view was uh, compassionate. There was a kid who cheated on a final exam his senior year, and my dad said, you, it's public knowledge, you can't graduate, but come back in August, I'll make sure you get your diploma. Mm -hmm. And the kid's mother came up to my mother and screamed obscenities at her. Your husband won't let my son graduate with his class. And here's what I think of him. And just went on for that. When my mother was shaking to her, her boots after that, she came into the house. Only time in my letter, I was like, give me a drink. <laughs> <laughs> I've never been called that. I didn't even know women could use those words. <laughs> but Elsie, what we have is the father has love. So, you have a heart of iron, but come sit on this chair, let our pain lie at rest a while, no matter how much we hurt. There's nothing to be gained from cold grief. Yes, the gods have woven pain into mortal lives while they are free from care. And Melissa, why don't you come up? You know the book. Why don't you read the book? Melissa gave me a book just before. Um, uh, class, um, and she said, you know, here's a uh, book talking about the psychology of forgiveness, and it says something like what we see going on here. That way I won't find them this their own okay. um, The author, Doris Donnelly, speaks about the stages of forgiveness, and I think, um, you know, when, when we've been wronged, one of the most difficult things to think about is forgiveness. Because we think that that means saying that it's okay, you know. Um, anyway, she talks about the different stages of forgiveness, and she cautions us not to rush to reconciliation, but uh, kind of like Art was talking about, you know, go away for a while and heal yourself, and then um, come back and don't, you know, hold that grudge forever. Um, it'll eat you up. <laughs> but um, get to that point. And um, I highlighted a few points of it. Uh, to forgive is to deny the laws of common sense and reason. The act of forgiveness is so ludicrous in the face of injury that we need to be eternally grateful that Jesus not only preached but also practiced forgiveness. Forgiveness demands that we look our hurt straight in the eye that we assess the damage done to our psyches, our bodies, our spirits, and with all our wits about us, choose, decide, will to forgive. And then um, she talks about the danger of <coughs> rushing to reconciliation without um, going through that stage. And she says, the truth is in short supply when we rush toward a reconciliation without pausing to forgive. Um, and she talks about the prodigal son who comes back and says, I am hurt, or uh, the father, uh, I am hurt, I will not fake a reconciliation. I am not ready to forgive because my wounds are too raw. Forgiveness is not easy. Forgiveness takes time. Um, and then later on, telling stories of human hurt and pain is a form of connectedness that enables us to appreciate the lavish, unconditional, total, perfect love of God, so unlike the meager way we do our forgiving. Could you give us the name and author again, please? Um, yeah, 
The book um, is Repentance and Reconciliation in the Church, and um, it's a series of four articles written by different authors. The first one that I quoted from is Doris Donnelly. so much. And as Van Doren says, um, Homer has it exactly here. It's not, oh, bingo, prime, I forgive you, but you have to go through this long process. Um, and then, let's go to the bottom of 484, and we'll leave that because we have uh, some sense of what's going, on. what's going on here. At the bottom of 484, um, Priam uh, talks to uh, Achilles says to him, don't sit me in a chair, prince, while Hector lies on line about 596, while Hector lies uncared for in your hut. Deliver him now so I can see him with my own eyes. And you take all this ransom we bring, take pleasure in it, and go back home to your fatherland. Since you've taken me, this first, excuse me, since you've taken this first step and allowed me to live and see the light of day. He says, I don't want to sit down and have a banquet with you, just let me see my son. And Achilles, his anger returns. Achilles glowered at him and said, don't provoke me, old man. It's my own decision to release Hector to you. A messenger came to me from Zeus, my own natural mother, daughter of the sea god. And I know you, Priam, inside out. You don't fool me one bit. So the anger is very close to the surface, still. And, and, and Homer plays this uh, with an incredible honesty and truthfulness. Reconciliation doesn't come in a magical moment in which you go, oh, there it is. Now let's go skipping through the daisies. <laughs> Achilles glowered at him and said, don't provoke me, old man, it's my decision. Well, we've talked, uh, John Van Allen left me a nice uh, note uh, the other day after I asked what a story is, and he says, uh, left me a couple of uh, thoughts. He said, what is a story? Well, it's got to be both real and have imagination and fine observation of what it is to be human in it. That's beautiful. It has to return us to the real, it has to speak of our own lives, and yet it has to be imaginary. It should have something of humor and sorrow and of the everyday in it. It should be colored with the rainbow. There should be something of elegance to it. And to show you how funny story is, we take this extraordinary passage from the Iliad in which the man uh, who killed the beloved son of an old man and tried to disfigure the body as compassion on the father and returns the body of the dead son to the father, having empathy for what the man is going through, is only one instance in the Iliad and the Odyssey of what the Greeks understood justice to be. And it's what Elsie told us about. Whenever anyone comes to you and supplicates you, or begs you to relieve their pain, do it. That same story in disguised form is present in one of the most gruesome stories of the Odyssey, the story of the Cyclops. And it's exactly the same story. You telling me that a guy with one eye who has his eye gouged out by Odysseus, I don't even like to think about that. He's telling the same story that's told here? Yep. yep. Because over and over again in the Iliad and in the Odyssey is a warning to human beings. Be careful you don't turn aside the person who comes to you in supplication. Without any understanding of what Christianity and Judaism are all about, the Greeks came to that understanding. God had to be working in some way in that society. He had to be. And if he was working in that society, why is he working with other societies? We've got to look quite very carefully 
Jerusalem has a lot to do with Athens. Jerusalem has a lot to do with Beijing. Jerusalem has a lot to do with Baghdad. We've got to look for the best in other societies and come to understand what they understand of empathy. And to do that, let's turn to this horrible um, story of the Cyclops in the Odyssey. My father-in-law thinks that this story is a mythological explanation of volcanoes. And several critics have the same sense, that the one eye in the Cyclops' head is the eye of the volcano, and the Cyclops is always furious and angry, and that's what a volcano is. Kaloa Kaloa is angry. <laughs> Fifteen different Hollywood movies on that. <laughs> Release the chief's brother and sister. <laughs> they make a great movie, and then when Odysseus leaves the island on the uh, ship, uh, the Cyclops throws rocks in them. Those, that's the lava coming out of the volcano and uh, the tremendous eruption and force of things. It's the destructive power of the volcano. And uh, we had a, a wonderful theologian here on campus uh, this past semester by the name of John Hout, whose uh, task in life is to say, what happens to God once you've turned on the nature channel and see a crocodile eat an animal? <laughs> That's a fancy way of saying, we now know that evolution has a lot of violence in it. How could a god, who is a good god, participate in that? How could a god will that an ugly crocodile would kill a beautiful animal? He's dedicated his whole life to that. The book is called God After Darwin. It's a brilliant book. And in it, he accuses some scientists of being the worst kind of fundamentalists. He says, there's a real problem with some scientists. He says, what you can see when you go to a doctor and say, well, since you can't heal this back, I'm going to a chiropractor. I'm out of this office. Only science has the answer. <laughs> That's voodoo magic. What did you say that word was? <laughs> And he says that the scientists think that the only thing that's real is that you can empirically test. He says, if you've lived any kind of a life, you know there are some things that are incredibly real in your life, you can't even find the words to put them to. And he says, you make a terrible mistake if you think people like Homer or the ancient Greeks were dumb. He says, look at the extraordinary things that they did with symbols. He said, I want to explain to you what a volcano is all about. Once upon a time, there was a man with one eye. <laughs> he says, let's get the scientists out doing a little more poetry. And that is, remind me, that's book nine, is it? Uh, book nine is a wonderful uh, book to read. It starts on page 124. Uh, Demodocus. Demodocus is Homer's self-portrait. Demodocus in the whole early part of book nine uh, is, uh, thanks to the story, I apologize for doing that. <laughs> um, uh, De uh, Demodocus is Homer, and uh, throughout book nine, um, Homer tells what it's like to listen to a person who sings songs of great heroes. And Demodocus is Homer, and he's not uh, unproud of the fact that <laughs> he's a bard in life. Uh, any more than I uh, think when I see how much doctors and lawyers make that I'm a teacher. I says, no, no, I still do some pretty good things. <laughs> you might have the uh, houses up on the hill and I might be down in the valley, but that's okay. There are other things in life. And chapter nine is uh, Odysseus telling his story of all the things that he's endured that make him the man of sorrows. And he does this during a uh, banquet uh, with Lord Alcinos. There's, a, there's an amazing uh, thing in this uh, uh, banquet, at uh, line 21. He says, I am Odysseus, great Laertes' son, known for my cunning throughout the earth. It was very important in Greek hospitality that you didn't know the name of who you were being hospitable to. It only came after the dinner. So you couldn't say, well, who are you? Let me know something about yourself before I give you a piece of the apple pie I have in the kitchen. Uh -uh. That violated the law of Zeus. You had to first give it and then say, okay, do you want to tell me who you are now? 
as if uh, Elsie's uh, folks had said to uh, Jack for Kenanville, first tell us who you are, make sure you're okay, then we'll give you a handout. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. I'll try not to move from now, sister. <laughs> so here we go, uh, and we'll go to uh, page 128 now. Cyclops are a mythological statement of what it is to be a volcano. A volcano is the angriest of all landforms. So the volcano is what Achilles is. And who has to face the uh, personification of the uh, 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 anger, the Cyclops, is Odysseus, who's the guy who's cool, who never loses it until his wife says, I move a marriage bed. <laughs> I can take everything else. <laughs> so here is anger facing cunning. Here is anger facing cunning. And not only that, everything the Cyclops represents is the direct opposite of what the glory of Greek civilization is. So you to read this as a negative for the photograph of what Greek civilization is, just as Achilles is the negative to the a splendid character that Odysseus is. Although sadly, it's not uh, part of Homer's story, but the guy who killed the child, Astyanax, was Odysseus. Threw him off the wall, banished him. So he wasn't always cool. And we came to the land of the Cyclops. Lawless savages who leave everything up to the gods. People who say you are a lawless savage if you don't see that God wants you to do something for yourself. <laughs> uh, we, we, uh, St. John's uh, has graduated an extraordinary uh, man by the name of Jack Davis. Anybody of you know the name Jack Davis? You can find him on the internet. He's an absolutely extraordinary man. Um, he came here to this university. He was not a Catholic and decided to become a Catholic and to become a priest and went back to the uh, Fargo uh, diocese and found that he had fallen in love with homeless people. And there are stories, there are books written about him. And he went out uh, every Thanksgiving, he would spend his way out in the streets picking up the most uh, wretched looking characters he could find and bringing them home and giving them a Thanksgiving dinner. Uh, well, after a while he thought that wasn't enough and he took off for Peru been working with the poor of uh, Peru, I think, for uh, 20 years now, and uh, has dedicated his life uh, to um, a city of uh, 30,000 poor people uh, down there. And St. John's gave him his highest uh, award at uh, graduation just this past year. He's an extraordinary man. I've met him uh, several times. Uh, and and uh, he said at the graduation ceremony, people ask me, are you a happy man now that you've done this? so unhappy that I have to live in a world where so much poverty can exist. Where people who are poor don't understand that it's not fate that they're poor. I have to train them again to say I can do something about this. That's like the Cyclops. And we came to the land of the Cyclops with lawless savages who leave everything up to the gods. <laughs> you say to your child, well, why don't you go out and find a job? <laughs> Are you kidding? He's <laughs> a new cyclops. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a funny life.